It's typey. Yes, okay. Well, let's start the panel. Let's start with some introductions. I'll just say off, say some names, and Bogdan, I'll put you last. Give you a moment. Uh, so, Jacopo. Hello, I'm uh, Jacopo Colonnelli, also known as Glass of Whiskey in the chat. And I am uh, from uh, University of Torino in Italy, and I'm the implementer of uh, the Streamflow uh, framework, which uh, supports uh, CWL tools of uh, version 0, 1, and 2. Welcome. Michael Collier. Hello, my name is Michael. I'm from uh, Cincinnati Children's Hospital Medical Center. I'm one of the developers of CWL Airflow. Welcome, Michael. Odris. Hello. Uh, my name is Odris. I'm a research software engineer uh, working at CERN. I'm one of the developers of a project called Rihanna. Uh, which stands for a reproducible analysis platform. Um, so, so, yeah. Hello, everyone. Thanks. Pratik? Uh, hi, everyone. My name is uh, Pratik Soares. I work at Illumina, and I work on Illumina Connected uh, Analytics, uh, which is a hosted solution for running workflows and managing your data. And we support CWL as well. Great. We've already met Peter Amstutz with Arvados. Peter, is there anything else you wanted to say? Uh, no. Well, I, as many of you know, I also wrote a large portion of CWL tool. Yep. I'll also be wearing that hat. And Bogdan, are you ready? Yep. Uh, I'm Bogdan, uh, uh, product uh, manager in Seven Bridges based in Belgrade, Serbia. Uh, not sure what else to add. Uh, which which Seven Bridges products are you going to be representing today? Uh, all of them. <laughs> Why don't you remind us the different platforms quickly? Sorry. Can you briefly remind us the different Seven Bridges platforms? Yes, of course. So we have the commercial platform for commercial customers. Uh, we also have platforms powered by Seven Bridges. Uh, we have Cancer Genomics Cloud that's used uh, uh, funded by NIH for cancer research. We have uh, the Cavatica platform, which is mainly used by the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. Uh, and we have um, uh, the Biodata Catalyst powered by Seven Bridges, which is uh, mainly focused on uh, heart, lung, blood, and sleep disorder research. And these, these are, are all the, cloud deployments, or are any of these on-premise? These are all, all cloud depo deployments. Uh, these all support multi-cloud. Uh, we tend to be as cloud agnostic as possible. Uh, so so then, uh, support multiple cloud providers. Great. And then, Marius, did you get an introduction? Um, well, I'm, I'm Marius. I uh, work for the Galaxy project, and um, yeah, I mean, I've been working on and off on CWL supporting Galaxy for a while. And you're a core, a member of the core team. Yes, core developer. Right. You're the manager. <laughs> so, uh, just about this panel, I thought it'd be just nice to for us to both talk to each other and answer questions from our audience. So please um, write in some questions for us. I know sometimes there's, I, I get lots of questions. People ask, what is the best platform? Which one should I use? Of course, there is no best platform. There's different runners and platforms and systems are really are good for different scenarios and different needs. And so I thought it might be nice just to discuss about the relative strengths and the different, you know, different scenarios that um, are targeted by each to help clear up some of that confusion. And then barring that, I've got some backup questions, but uh, I'm mostly interested in what the participants would like to hear about. So I guess let's just start with briefly what, um, I'll go through the list again. Tell me 
what scenario are, is your platform or product targeting? So what, what is the, what produces the happiest outcomes, the thing that you're really built for? So let's start with uh, Jacopo. Why, why, why did Streamflow really target it for? So Streamflow is, has been designed mainly for two uh, scenarios. One is uh, a mixed cloud HPC for flows. So being able to run a portion of a workflow on HPC and the remaining steps on the cloud or vice versa or mixing them. And uh, uh, this uh, obviously requires uh, automatic data transfer. So this was the main uh, part that we added to, 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 our, to our system. The other is uh, uh, supporting multi-agent steps. So one step that needs to run on uh, multiple nodes Think about, for example, an MPI workload that needs uh, more uh, more uh, physical nodes to be allocated for it to run, or maybe a, a cloud uh, step that has the, to run in a microservices complex deployment made by multiple heterogeneous containers, and so we added uh, to the same flow the capacity to automatically deploy and undeploy complex uh, execution environments on top of which executing its uh, its steps and this is would you classify streamflow as a workflow runner uh, you just sort of set it and then it does its thing but it's not going to track maybe the history or is it more of a platform? Is it going to sort of help manage the history of previous runs, maybe also manage data or um, something more complex? At the moment, Simflow is a runtime support. So it, it focuses on uh, a single run. It obviously stores uh, intermediate data. It can manage fault tolerance, checkpointing, but it is not uh, neither multi-tenant. So there is not the concept of user nor the concept of uh, uh, orchestration of multiple workflows together. This is the second thing is what is going on in the across European project. So to ha uh, help uh, people orchestrating multiple workflows. And uh, uh, Simflow also does not offer a, a user interface. And this is maybe the, the, the worst thing about it because all the people say, ah, yes, it's very good, but where is the graphic interface? Because yeah. they find it uh, low level. But in reality, Steamflow is low level by choice. We want to support the low level and let uh, other implementers maybe to uh, use it for implementing the higher level. Yeah, and it's open source. Is there any commercial support available? No, it is totally open source. So we have a, a LGPL version three license. It is maintained by our research group and uh, all, now also for uh, from uh, external contributors of European project. But it's definitely a, a non-commercial product. It's a research product, which doesn't mean this will not be maintained uh, across the years because it is already in a, at least five uh, European projects. So. The, we it for at least five years has uh, there is money for, to support uh, its development, but we are not, never going to offer it as a commercial product simply because we are university and we cannot uh, yep. do this because we are breaking the law basically. If yeah, we yeah no it. worries. Just just helping people understand. Okay, so same questions for Michael Colliar and CWL Airflow. So the first question was, is it a workflow runner, a platform, or something more complicated, and then about commercial support? Um, it's, uh, I would say it's workflow management system built on top of Airflow. Uh, so we use a lot of functionality from the Airflow that allows us to have a web UI, to save logs, to access the logs, to see which tasks are currently run, running, to restart them. 
let's say there is some failed step, we can restart it using Airflow UI uh, in case we configured it to save all of the temporary data between the steps. Uh, we also extended partially Airflow with uh, sending uh, some statistics reports, how many temporary data was used, what is the size of the outputs, when each step is started, when it's finished, how much time it took, and so on. Uh, it is currently used. Uh, it, it is currently used by Sida, it's a scientific data analysis platform, which is commercial. But CW Airflow is open source, and it will remain open source as far as I know. Uh, uh, internally, it basically uses a lot of functionality from CWL tool, so all of the new features from CWL tool uh, supposedly should be easily integrated into CWL Airflow unless we have some bugs or something like some tiny, tiny things that should be corrected. Um, that's kind of the main uh, information about CWL Airflow. Okay, thank you. Well then, briefly, as succinctly as you can, same questions. Workflow runner, platform, something more complicated, and the commercial side. Yeah, and Bridges uh, is pr pretty much a, a, a platform that tends to be the ecosystem for bioinformatics research. So running workflows is just one part of the story. There's also uh, IDs, Jupyter notebook integrations, uh, various integrations with multiple data sets that are available, uh, with handling, of course, all the credential uh, messing uh, access whatever goes in that uh, and and much more yeah so so for from the CW standpoint it's a platform where you can build the workflows uh, a web web uh, web based uh, workflow composer basically uh, si similar thing to the rabbit composer the desktop app, and also where you can run run workflows in the cloud and commercial support, open source. What's the story? Yeah, it's a it's a commercial product. Uh, yep. You sell support. You sell access. Yep. Yep. Okay. Uh, going through Adrius, is Rihanna a workflow runner platform? Something more complicated. What's the open source and story? And what's the commercial support story? Yeah. Yeah. So Rihanna is free and open source uh, platform. Uh, to run the reproducible analysis on, on the cloud. Uh, basically, it works by parsing the workflows, uh, workflows information by submitted by the researcher and dispatching the computational steps uh, of the workflow to, to our several supported uh, compute backends. So we currently uh, currently the platform runs on, on Kubernetes cluster and uh, dispatches all the all the computational steps there but uh, it allows uh, to quite easily select uh, different compute backends like uh, Wonder or Swarm to execute the, the computational steps in, in these environments also we use docker to kind of specify the environment uh, to, to, to ensure the reproducibility. And we also support different uh, workflow languages. So uh, one of it is, of course, CWL, but we support as well uh, Snakemake and any added workflow languages. So, so yeah. And is there commercial support available? No, no, no. It's completely free and of course. Uh, available under the MIT license. Sure. Pratik, tell us about ICA. Um, yeah, actually, I do have uh, Charlie uh, on the call, who's the product owner for, for the software, and he can talk about it a bit more. Uh, if you don't mind, can I ask him to um, talk? Sure, thanks, Pratik. And sorry, I don't have my webcam enabled. Hopefully, you folks can uh, at least hear me. Yeah, we can hear you. Awesome. Um, so yeah, I'm the technical product manager out here at Illumina. I'm based in San Diego. I'm um, speaking at Boston City. We have a team in uh, Belgium. Um, Illumina Connected Analytics, we call ICA, is a uh, full-fledged multi-tenant um, platform for data management and pipeline management and running. Um, so we allow for you know development and maintenance of pipelines. Allow you know we enable bringing existing CWL uh, tools uh, 
to our platform as well as creating them from scratch. We do have uh, UI, uh, API, and CLI interfaces. Um, the uh, we do have a composer even for um, granted. It's, uh, I would say not. It's it's immature. It doesn't quite have the full CWL feature uh, support yet. But we do have the ability to compose CWL pipelines um, using a graphical editor. Um, something that's kind of one of the selling points of the product. Um, we are multi. Uh, we're striving to be multi-cloud. We currently have we leverage Kubernetes to kind of make, you know, as an infrastructure component to enable that uh, cloud agnostic uh, architecture. Um, and we are just recently commercially uh, released. We just had our first uh, first commercial release uh, just this last month. So we are new to the market. Super. Um, so commercial release, you're commercially supporting this. Any source availability, any open source? Uh, no critique. I don't have any comments on that. No, no open source. Not at the moment. We don't uh, don't have the software available as an open source uh, solution. But we're looking at you know what components could be uh, packaged and uh, released as as open source. But nothing uh, at the moment. Understood. Peter. Same questions. Hello. Uh, well, first I, <laughs> I'd like to say when when we were sort of kicking off the. Uh, CWL project, uh, one of our theories was that we can't really stop people from writing software. Uh, people will keep writing their own workflow engines. And so the fact that there's eight people, eight implementations represented here, and this is not even all of them, is uh, is pretty impressive and also validates our theory that, that everyone's got their own, they've got their own needs and they're going to write software, so let's find another place to uh, to collaborate instead of just telling everybody to use the same implementation. So so this is pretty cool to see. Um, yeah, so uh, representing uh, Arvados, uh, I guess uh, I actually went over a lot of this in my, in my uh, talk, but uh, I guess the, so Arvados is a platform, so we, have a heavy data management component as well as a workflow execution component. Um, our kind of theory of value for Arvados is that by making the data management kind of integral to workflow execution, you are able to capture a lot more of what happened in order to ensure uh, good reproducibility and uh, portability and sort of ability to migrate a workflow and through different environments. Um, the Arvados platform runs on, uh, well, you can run it on a single node, you can run it on, uh, on Slurm, you can run it on LSF, uh, you can run it on AWS and Azure. So cloud and HPC, we can support other, of course, uh, add support for other systems uh, fairly easily. Uh, since since that's part of the architecture, uh, it is all open source. Um, the server components are AGPL. The client components, uh, like software development kits, uh, things that you would use in your own scripts, are Apache two. So uh, you can you know interact with the platform uh, without any you know sort of GPL contamination issues uh, for those who. For, for those who for whom that's an issue um, and oh yeah and and uh, <laughs> we're so it's it is open source but it is a commercially supported open source so Perry corporation offers uh, support for uh, for Arvados so if you want to talk to us we can you know, we can we can help you install it. You can run it on your own infrastructure, or you can have us run it for you. Um, we'll you know help you write workflows, help you optimize things, help you write you know integrate other software with with Arvados. Uh, all kind of aspects of uh, integrating that into your um, you know into your your solution, I guess. Um, so I think that that kind of is. 
Marius, I'm going to try to summarize in the interest of time, and you can tell me if I get it wrong. I would characterize, because you did recently talk extensively about Galaxy, so I would characterize it for this discussion as a workflow and data platform that has uh, that is open source. And I think there is some consultancy out there that does provide some commercial support. That's right. Yeah, Galaxy works. Yep. But that's completely separate from the open source project, even though there's some personal overlap. I, yeah, I long admired the governance structure of Galaxy. And then for the reference runner CWL tool, um, it is not meant to be anything more than the exemplar for running and testing new CWL features. It's, of course, lots of people use it for local development. That's great. It does not submit jobs to anything uh, on its own. It's not intended to be used in production, though as a library, it is used by a couple of the implementations here. Um, uh, this, it is released in the Apache 2.0 license. I think Curie will offer some consulting about CWL tool, but that's the only, maybe others also would offer consulting or commercial support. Um, they can speak up. Great. So that's the big summary. Let's talk about uh, user interface. I, there's a question kind of related to that. We had this come up earlier. How are, how are we visualizing these, these CWL tools and workflows? What could we do differently? What can we do together? Uh, so I'll, I'll throw this question open to the floor. Do we need some extensions or something new in there to improve the visualization? Are you using your own extensions already? Or maybe you don't think it matters? I can speak for seven bridges. Uh, we we use uh, well. There's few few ways to interpret visualization. So there's one thing to visual the workflow graph, for example. The other thing is to visualize the interface for actually submitting a, uh, an execution. Uh, for the workflow graph, we 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 actually offer open source uh, libraries. Two open source libraries. Uh, Rab I'll put some links here. Uh, these are Rabix CWLTS, uh, which is a TypeScript uh, uh, TypeScript data model for CWL, which also is updated for I think CWL 1.2. And we have uh, CWL SVG, uh, which is uh, a library for generating interactive SVG. So, uh, Rabix Composer used that originally. To, to generate a visualization uh, and uh, I know other other uh, people uh, use these libraries for their own purposes so so this is something that can be can be used by anyone who, to create anything and uh, this is also answer the question from Kevin uh, we don't have a, a plan to release Oracle Builder uh, we have one on the platform and nested in the platform but uh, we don't plan to release anything like out out there however anyone can do it with these two libraries uh, it should it should be relatively uh, relatively uh, uh, easy to, to to achieve do you have any tricks to add additional information beyond what's already part of the CWL standards to enhance the display or yes. interaction with the tools yes so we, we had a bunch of fields in the to the app uh for one example trivial example is uh when you edit the workflow you drag and drop nodes and basically we save x and y coordinates uh in the in the work for each node so that's how you you, you save this information when you get back to the workflow uh, it looks the same as, as when you last edited it and also a bunch of other other metadata like who, who are the authors what's the for if it, if it's a command line tool what's the license for it uh, a lot of information like that and uh, we'll add things like that are at same bridge platform specific for example for tool inputs uh, we allow user to specify uh, extension so when they start uh, uh, when, when they set up a, a task when they set up a run uh, the files in their environment are filtered by the, this extension. This is just like one, one simple example. How, like, but I think Marius uh, mentioned previously, it's a, a strain on the tool authors to populate all these extensions. 
but for the users it's it's much neater because uh, it saves the click work <laughs> yeah i mean also if you have i mean i guess i guess it sort of depends what environment you're in but in galaxy uh you can have hundreds of thousands of items um if that's you know, you just have one tabular file at the end and you say, hey, I need a tabular file. That's much easier than going through 100,000 items. Um, and it is it is a must in Galaxy Tools. So that sort of thing, which file type it is, what it consumes, that is absolutely necessary. Um, I'm also kind of interested in, yeah, I mean, would there be some interest in sort of collecting um, fields that we have found useful? So for instance, um, we allow validations to happen, so you can, I mean, unfortunately, these are Python expressions, but um, so for instance, you could think about a regex uh, that you can use to validate the input, um, some help text, um, that sort of thing where, you know, we could just say, you know, they're not mandatory, but various implementations could support these fields. And I mean, certainly it sounds like you already have some um, fields that you're using, I mean, I'd be interested to just uh, sort of know what they are. So, yeah. yeah. Uh, I just wanted to quickly, uh, you know, uh, pitch in as well. So, um, I mean, if you have a platform with multiple language support, then, you know, having something that is kind of an abstract way shows, you know, you know, the DAG or something which is independent of a language is useful to visualize and to kind of, you know, uh, support tooling within your platform. So, I mean, the doc file is, I think, a good starting point. But yeah, I mean, you know, uh, uh, we are looking at, you know, how we can enhance um, uh, that mechanism to uh, as much as possible abstract out the, you know, suitable specific stuff and, you know, have a, have a generic way of representing uh, kind of nodes and the relationship between each other. Uh, for visualization purpose in the UI. Uh, uh, so you you want to generate you want to visualize generic workflows um, because you're supporting other workflow languages. Yeah. So in ICA today we support Nextflow and and CWL. Um, and I mean the idea is that we want to kind of you know uh, support you know the languages that the community is using and you know this list will uh, hopefully change in the future um, and that's why i mean you know in a platform we want to have a way to kind of abstract out you know common things between languages and sometimes it is difficult but at least for dag based languages it is you know easy to see nodes um, and the relation you know what comes before you know the next step in the workflow and uh, we are trying to figure out how we can use that information to um, uh, represent basically your different workflows in in a in a abstract way I just left a note in the chat. Um, you, you might want to look at the workflowhub.eu. They had a similar need. And we actually added something into CWL 1.2, the abstract operation. Um, so you can represent a workflow from another system, but use the same CWL structure, even though you're not providing all the reproducible parts. Um, so they just use CWL as the model to sh represent the shape and the metadata and authorship and what's the underlying tool. But the, the workflow would still be shared and run in its native non-CWL format if it's not CWL. Um, that's, contact me later to get more information if you can't find it yourself. I, I can connect you to that. Perfect. Thank you. I'll, I'll take a look. Any other comments on, uh, I did also leave a link to a proposal to refine suitable input types called validations or restrictions. That hopefully we'll see more movement on this year. Any other thoughts from anybody on representing a particular tool invocation or workflow invocation to the users? I can add a few details. I'm uh, not the representative of CIDAB, but because I develop the workflows that are mainly used on CIDAB, I know which features uh, we use. Uh, can you hear me, by the way? Yeah. Good. Cool. So uh, one of the useful things for CWL that probably would be nice to have is uh, to add some extra information for the output that can be useful for visualizing the results. So what we have inside of, we have kind of a system of plugins that tells us whether it's a table, it's a picture, it's a plot, pie chart, or other stuff. And we just, when I develop the workflow, I just add this information to the output. 
And another cool feature that we have is uh, a way to say which workflow was an upstream to the other workflow. Of course, we could connect, connect it based on the inputs and outputs, but in addition to that, we provide a path or the name of the CWL file that in theory could generate, or in our case, really generated all of the inputs, all of the outputs that we use as input for, for another workflow. So these two features that uh, we had to add to our CWL files. Great. Um, we have a question in chat about um, Kubernetes support. Uh, and so it looks like they're just looking for who supports Kubernetes and then possibly this, um, I don't know what's this uh, particular HPC scheduler is using um, uh, as it's, oh, so it's a PBS job. Oh, so I'll, I'll reply in chat about that, but what can we just quickly uh, please volunteer your Kubernetes support level. I, I can talk uh, first. So um, ICA uh, does use Kubernetes. However, um, in CWL, there's no construct about, I mean, it runs in Kubernetes, but that's just kind of a, like an implementation detail. Uh, so we can take advantage of scaling up um, and you know, uh, dealing with you know, a large scatter gather job, for example. Uh, and this is all backed by our Kubernetes implementation. Uh, what we have kind of, Experience is that while Kubernetes is a good interface, um, you know it is uh, very hard to kind of you know operationalize Kubernetes uh, because of you know the nuances with you know the APIs and the you know the distributed system that it is. Um, so uh, in a cloud system, I guess you know you just you know a caution if you're planning to run your own Kubernetes environment, just be aware that you know there are these things that you'll have to worry about, uh, especially when you start talking about running thousands of workflows. Uh, for a simple use case, it might be okay, but yeah, as you start scaling up, you will run into Kubernetes-specific issues. Um, I don't know what other details uh, I can provide, but yeah, you know, you you can basically choose the instance type that you want to use. Um, uh, in CWL, you can use the CPU and memory uh, requirement, but we also have you know Illumina-specific hints uh, that will allow you to choose a spot instance, that will allow you to choose a specific instance, that will allow you to choose FPGA or other kind of hardware uh, requirements. Um, and um, uh, is Illumina supporting the Earth Science domain? So these aren't. This isn't a life science person. I see. Um, well, I guess um, not directly meaning that we're not doing anything special. But there's nothing uh, preventing you from running it um, in in Illumina. I guess our uh, main use case is the you know the life science uh, domain. But there's nothing in there that basically is specialized for anything. Uh, but at the same time, we don't have anything, you know, any specific implementation. It's a generic uh, uh, executor, C CWL executor that can scale up and basically handle uh, many, many jobs and many, um, you know, terabytes of inputs and outputs. Super. Anybody else with Kubernetes support that they want to talk about? Uh, in Streamflow, we, we support Kubernetes and we uh, support it through Elm charts to build up the execution environments. So basically you map a step of our flow into a pod described into the Helm chart and then run uh, both of them. And Streamflow does the, the magic tricks. Uh, we also support singularity. I don't, didn't understand if the question is singularity over Kubernetes because this is another issue which is not so easy to accomplish because Singularity does not uh, conform to uh, Kubernetes CRI. I know there is a, a, a project, but it was uh, uh, in a beta as the last time I checked. And so I think it is not ready to production, but maybe I am wrong. And have you tested on the three major cloud vendors Kubernetes offerings or uh, only uh, like a local Kubernetes cluster? No, I tested on uh, on direct Kubernetes access through kubectl, both in uh, our cloud and in another cloud, but both are backed by OpenStack. Okay. Both are commercial cloud that I cannot say the name and uh, our cloud, but both backed by OpenStack. Okay. So it may work, but it's to be determined. 
Yes. Andres, would you like to talk about Rihanna and Kubernetes? Yes, sure. So, yeah, Rihanna definitely supports Kubernetes. Uh, actually, the platform itself uh, runs uh, on the Kubernetes cluster. And basically, dispatches, uh, while it parses the workflow, it dispatches the, the, the jobs uh, to the Kubernetes as well by default. Uh, but as I mentioned previously, we also support uh, HD Condor and Slurm compute backend, so it's easy quite easy to kind of specify the specific step of the workflow to, to use a different compute backend. And have you tested on any of the big three commercial cloud uh, offerings for Kubernetes? Uh, actually, we are uh, testing uh, the Google cloud, cloud right now. Uh, it seems to be working uh, just fine, but we still need to to kind of solve the final issues on the auto scaling uh, feature. But it basically it 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 works as as expected over there. Great, Marius. What's the Galaxy Kubernetes story? Um, I think that's the primary. Uh, we, we deploy Galaxy in Kubernetes for the commercial product and for Anvil um, and for ITCR. So it it has a lot of, uh, received a lot of attention. Uh, it supports auto scaling, resource requirements. Um, well, everything we, we need, basically. Um, but in general, for Galaxy, we you write job runner plugins. Uh, they are very modular and yeah, it's pretty straightforward to write these. You just Submit, you specify your resources, and you wait. Um, and so we have support for Slurm, PBS, HD Condor, um, anything that has a CLI submitter can be used. Um, yeah. Have we tested the CWL fork of Galaxy with the Kubernetes backend? No, we're just uh, currently testing in uh, with, with a local runner, but there's no reason to think there would be any problem. And how do you, uh, while Galaxy is not formally specific to a particular domain, is there much earth science domain usage? Do you feel it might be a problem or not matter? Um, so we have in the user interface a few tweaks that date from Galaxy's past in the biological sciences um, that we're trying hard to paper over or to remove or to replace with some more generic things. but. Um, we have climate sciences um, that are extensively using Galaxy, um, chemistry, and so on. So it's not tied to biology or life sciences in general. Yep. I mean, my understanding is a lot of image analysis, so it probably should be a, a fine fit. Yeah, I mean, it depends what sort of job. I mean, Galaxy could do a little better in small job throughput. Like we can create, like, yeah. Each process can create about 2,000 jobs per hour, which is kind of limiting for small, really small jobs. But yeah, as long as it's a couple of seconds, we should be good. Peter, what's the Arvados uh, Kubernetes story? And also, same Earth Sciences question. So right now, we're not <clears throat> supporting Kubernetes for production use, although that's probably going to change in the next few months. Uh, that would involve being able to install the Arvados core services using a Helm chart. Um, however, the way that Arvados actually runs services, it deploys its own um, container management process that does a lot of the same things that the Kubernetes, uh, whatever, minions agents uh, do and so it ends up um, not working very it not not really making sense to use um, to try to run uh, the actual like compute jobs on top of kubernetes so what we're looking at is probably a, kind of a hybrid where the uh, system services are kubernetes managed but the ephemeral compute nodes in the cloud are using um, the underlying like EC2 or Azure or something like that. Um, 
Or, I mean, you could also do something kind of silly like using Slurm on top of Kubernetes to do scheduling, but then you have to spin up a bunch of nodes at a time and just keep those up forever, uh, which is awkward. So if you want auto-scaling, uh, my understanding is auto it, it's sort of an awkward fit still to you, that use Kubernetes auto-scaling with compute jobs when you're generating a lot of different jobs of different shapes and sizes and resource requirements. Mm -hmm. um, My understanding is historically Kubernetes has not been a great fit for batch style uh, task systems. And that, but it's been getting a lot of interest, and that's been changing. I, I saw they just launched a new working group uh, proposing a new uh, Kubernetes API, and specifically for batch task support, uh, queuing support. Uh, so I think we'll see a lot of change in that space. But I do hear a lot of crunchiness from implementers. Uh, but everybody wants it, so I guess we're going to make it work. Is this, is this volcano? There's a whole new thing besides Volcano okay. to support support things like Volcano and Kubeflow mm -hmm. and a lot of the other stuff going on. Um, we formally have three minutes left in the session, but I'm happy for it to run longer as, as long as panelists want to still go. And there are additional questions, but I'll just remind everybody of the schedule. Um, briefly, before people drop off, I do want to say thanks to everybody for, for participating for the questions. We will get this video up. Uh, hopefully later this week, and um, uh, but let's go back to the panelists. Panelists, do you have questions for each other? Throw the floor open here. I, Michael. Yeah, I have a question, and it's actually related to Kubernetes. So CWL Airflow directly does not support Kubernetes. However, there are some features in Airflow that can be used for Kubernetes. And I was curious whether Illumina is still using Airflow as a workflow management system, and were you able to actually make it run with Kubernetes without any complications? Or you switched to some other uh, tool instead of CW Airflow or Airflow? Uh, sure, I can, I can answer that. Um, so while we use um, Airflow in the past, um, uh, and we still still use it, um, uh, however, we, have, we are moving away from that uh, for a few reasons. Uh, one of them is uh, um, we were using Airflow mostly as an orchestration layer, meaning it keeps track of you know what comes before and after each step. The actual compute happens outside uh, for us. Um, so the the way Kuber uh, Airflow supports Kubernetes is kind of a little strange. Uh, you know, it doesn't provide you that much of dynamicness. Uh, so it's not a good fit for CWL uh, simply because CWL you don't know upfront you know what the task will look like till you get to that point uh, because of expressions and so on. Uh, so we actually decided to not use Airflow at all. Uh, we use a um, uh, very different uh, implementation uh, now, uh, where we generate the pod spec uh, ourselves uh, based on uh, basically the work that has happened until that point. Uh, so at every point in the in the workflow, uh, we get to inspect you know the progress so far and kind of get to determine what the uh, what the next step would look like, and then we can generate the we have full control over the pod spec. Um, so that's kind of, you know, I guess in a nutshell, you know, how we are approaching it. And happy to talk to you, Michael, offline and kind of, you know, uh, chat about some of the, you know, details about the problems we were running into. Okay, thank you. Any other panelist to panelist questions? Jokopo. Yes, I, I would like to ask, uh, I know that uh, now CWL is going to release 1.2.1. My question is, uh, how far we are from another big uh, release of the standard? Because I know as an implementer that this is not an easy thing to to do, to add the support for new versions. So I would like to ask uh, how much time I have to rest before. <laughs> Peter, you want to answer this? So right now, well, right now things are a, a little bit, are moving pretty slowly. The one point, per, the goal of the 1.2.1 release was, is simply to incorporate new uh, conformance tests and clarifications and not to introduce any new features. So if it's, 
cause if if supporting 1.2.1 causes you problems, it's because you were probably doing something wrong in the first place, or or it, it was a, a part of the specification. Part. What? I hate to say something wrong. Yeah. All right. <laughs> well. Under I, I was gonna follow that. Yeah, I was gonna follow up and say it was it was or it was my fault or somebody's fault for not not uh, describing it, you know, precisely enough. Um, you know, there was something ambiguous, and if, you know, programming languages always have this. Uh, people keep finding more and more, uh, you know, edgy or edge cases, I guess that need to be nailed down. So, you know, somebody will find a way to interact, cause, you know, four different features to interact and then it's not clear what's supposed to happen. So it's it's those kinds of clarifications um, that are going into 1.2.1. 1. Uh, for 1.3, I'm not sure what's, that, that's, that's still, that's much further off. Um, the only thing that's, Probably on the table for 1.3 would be um, GPU support. Uh, this CUDA requirement was uh, introduced in CWL tool as an extension, and um, and if there's uh, you know if other implementations pick that up, agree that that's the right way to represent uh, GPU requests, then we would um, that would go into 1.3. Uh, but I'm not sure there's anything that's sort of urgently expected for 1.3. So actually, I guess that would be a good <laughs> point of discussion is if there's anything that people want to see in the next revision, something that's missing that uh, we really should be adding that would help. Please write in chat. Yeah. <laughs> Can I can I can I say I, one? I would thing? say probably a, at least a a year for one point three. I don't see how it could happen sooner, unless we decide to do a really quick turnaround just to add something. But if it's available as an extension, like the CUDA requirement, I don't know if that needs a whole new release of the standard just for one little thing that anybody could implement on the side. So just to your earlier question about a timeline. Go Thank ahead. You. No, I would I would like to to maybe we can use this last minutes to discuss about something that we should propose or something like that, if you agree. So I wanted to to tell you that one thing that I there are two things basically. One is support for streaming data, but this I know is very hard, so it is is uh, is very 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 hard to to support. The other is error handling, so something to a way to specify. Uh, triggering one step if another step goes on, a, for example, returns a particular error code or stuff like that. So having explicit exception handling in the workflow instead of to have only generic fault tolerance for the entire workflow. This is what uh, users ask me basically. So. And, and to chime in there, we have seen some similar cases also where, especially when you do scatter gather, you know, and certain branches fail, uh, people want to kind of be explicit about how they want to address those issues, how they want to kind of proceed, uh, or you know, retries and so on. So um, it'll be good to see, you know, like a standard way of you know uh, dealing with uh, these situations. We actually have um, two ways to do this at Galaxy. I mean, obviously, like, when you start running scatter jobs over 10,000 items, one is eventually going to fail. So um, we have two things. We have the job cache. So if there was a job that already ran with the same inputs, outputs, uh, parameters, um, then we just pick that up. And the other one, because it's a graphical user interface, people could just pick the failed job and run it again and replace um, the inputs in the DAG. But I don't know how that would look like for CWL. It's it's the two options in Galaxy for how you can deal with this. Yeah, we, we also have basically coming back to the last available output and start again the computation from that point. But these are all automatic and ge very general purpose strategy that you can implement as a as, as a baseline, let me say. But if one user says that one thing probably will fail and want to have a backup custom strategy, this would be very 
very nice. Yeah. For I mean, example, the other because things... a training doesn't converge, maybe. I mean, so for and instance, if you download stuff that you get an HTTP response, they would say, well, you've downloaded too many things, um, or you, yes, you, you need to throttle your requests or things like that. Um, use the conditional support in 1.2 to do an alternate behavior so maybe it's maybe it's well perhaps there could be explicit error handling but maybe it's something where there needs to be some examples of how you can kind of put together the pieces that exist to do that Yeah, that's a good point. I mean, there might be existing mechanisms. It's just that uh, probably, you know, just highlighting that this is, you know, how you could, for example, do error handling would be okay. But yeah, good point, uh, Peter. I'll, I'll go and explore those. Uh, that makes a lot of sense. I, I agree with Peter that something can be done, but not all, in my opinion. For example, an on timeout when a uh, tool time limit is triggered would also be useful, but this is something that you have to do outside the single command and uh, at the workflow level. So I agree that there are uh, somehow the, what can I say, workarounds, and I myself, I'm using them, but I think that uh, workflow level API would be nice. If you have a proposal for that, you should definitely <laughs> you should definitely propose it <laughs> so we can talk about it more because I'm not I'm just not sure what it would look like. Sorry, I'm not sure what this would look like. So I think you should definitely propose something oh, yes. so we can be more uh, specific. I, 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 I'm sure this would not would far from being obvious. This is the only thing I, we, I am sure about. <laughs> so I, I think uh, it deserves a, a long discussion, in my opinion. But uh, the, the will to, to in, initiate this discussion is fundamental. So. I actually have a question to the other deployers, especially those that have a graphical user interface. Do you actually have a graphical user interface for two descriptions, or do you limit yourselves to whole workflows? Uh, I can comment from the ICA side. We do have from our, our graphical interface a way to describe tools. So we have kind of a, uh, yeah, we've translated um, we have widgets kind of to describe uh, all the different uh, components of the tool description. We even have kind of a way to see how that um, results in the underlying tool description. Basically, we have a way for a user to paste a CWL tool uh, command line tool description into our UI and have that populate our UI with elements that correspond to those widgets or go the other way around and populate the widgets and then see the corresponding command line tool definition that's been um, rendered by those um, for those elements or widgets. So do you have extra fields, um, you know, that are more human readable, like, you know, labels where, you know, that you could display above, um, let's say you have a text parameter, you have a label that goes above that just briefly, you know, gives the punchy description and uh, a help text that might be more extended. And, and, you know, I mean, these are the sort of things we have for Galaxy tools. And I, I'm sorry I'm bringing it up again. I, I, I mentioned it before, but I was just, just wondering, like, have you sort of, if any of the implementers, like, have, um, you know, a set of fields that we could just use, or if everybody's going to do their own? Yeah, for that particular functionality, there's no, um... Uh, implementation specific field that we've added to support that. Uh, it's all leveraging uh, whatever native CWL fields there are um, for those elements. We'd be happy to show you kind of what that looks like to make it, you know, so it makes more sense. But yeah, there's no extensions or any um, additional fields to support hmm. that.
any other panelist to panelist questions or from the audience. We have a really exciting uh, collection of people all here together. Also, we had a very action-packed conference, so I understand that people are a little tired. The good news is we meet basically every week on Wednesdays at a time that's good for both the Americas and Europe, Middle East, and, and Africa. Um, so all of these topics we can go into uh, detail in uh, much more detail in the future. You can just go ahead and write on the calendar on the agenda for a future week, just put down a topic. Um, I'll drop the link uh, in chat right now. Um, so please keep these conversations going. We also have the mailing list if need be, but more likely the, the forum is a good place also for longer conversations. Or if there's a specific proposal, go out, open that, that issue on GitHub. But we might be done. I think we are done with the panel. This was a really great session, jam-packed, the, the session with the most talks. We still have session two and three coming later this week um, with more panels and a couple other new talks. Um, so please do check those out. Please don't stay up too late. Everything will be recorded. It's not set up for somebody to be able to attend the whole, the whole th all three sessions. Um, and also, we do kind of think about, ask you all to think about supporting us financially. Obviously, this conference is free to all the participants and the speakers. And if it would not be a burden, we'd appreciate a, a 50 US dollar uh, donation to our fiscal host, the Software Freedom Conservancy, on behalf of the CDWL project. Uh, as people on the forum may have noticed there will be CDWL socks coming, and this will help fund that, amongst other good things. So that is all I had to close us out. Thanks again to everybody uh, who stayed this entire time. That's fantastic. You can continue talking with each other in this channel or maybe switch over to the main channel. I saw somebody ask some questions there even during this last panel. So thank you for that. Have a great rest of your day and evening and hope we'll see some of you in session two and some others of you in session three, otherwise online. So take care. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you, everyone.